What is going on everyone? Welcome to another very exciting episode right here on the MI Gardener channel. In today's episode, we're gonna talk about why most pest deterrents stop working. We're talking about pest deterrents as it applies to animals, things like birds, rabbits, squirrels, deer, you name it, large garden pests like that. Why the pest deterrents that we use work for a little while and then stop working altogether. And it has to do with, well, Pavlov's dog. Ah! Did that scare you? Well, if it did, it's because you weren't expecting it. Let's do it again. Ah! Did it scare you that time? It didn't. Well, why? It's because you're expecting it. And that's exactly why most pest deterrents stop working, is the average animal actually only needs roughly five to seven instances for it to be completely used to whatever scare tactic is being used. You see, the fight or flight response that most animals have uh, kicks in when they feel threatened. And when that threat fails to actually be a threat, it's kind of just a false alarm, after a while, it becomes irrelevant. And they just realize that it's part of, uh, you know, it's, it's just part of the environment now. It's something that happens. If they come into the garden and they hear, uh, like, let's say, it's like tin cans rattling, at first it might startle them and they might get skittish and run away because it's foreign to them. However, if they come back and they hear that sound again, they realize that they weren't harmed the first time. They might still be a little bit skittish, but they realize after the third time or maybe the fourth time, wait a second, nothing's happening. This is fine. I'm not dying. My fight or flight response doesn't need to be kicking in. I don't need to have that, that kind of innate survival instinct that, that uh, usually kicks in with something foreign. I'm used to this now. I'm gonna go about eating. And so that is why so often when we have things like whirly gigs, spinny CDs, um, motion detection uh, sprinklers, motion, de uh, motion detector lights and horns and things like that, you can throw the kitchen sink at animals and after a while, they just stop working. And it has to do with Pavlov's dog. If you're a dog trainer, you probably know this firsthand. There is, a, uh, there is basically a, a scientist, Pavlov, and he would test with his dogs, uh, getting them to go outside to go to the bathroom using a positive, you know, basically positive feedback loop of ringing a bell, offering a treat, giving a command, and after a while, the dog would ring the bell to get the treat and would, you know, go to the bathroom, basically communicating through positive, uh, positive feedback. And so since the dog wanted a treat, um, the dog would ring the bell whenever it had to go to the bathroom, but would also then learn that if it rang the bell without having to go to the bathroom, it would think that it still got a treat because it associated ringing the bell with the treat, not necessarily going outside. And this happens all the time. If you treat it, uh, teach a dog to shake, uh, what you can do is you give a command, shake, put the dog's paw, uh, paw in your hand, and, you get, uh, and then you give the treat to the dog. Then uh, what you do is you, after a while, you simply say shake, the, the dog will put its paw out with no treat because it, it assumes that command equals a treat. Once it does that, you give positive feedback by giving the treat after the command. And this way, uh, the dog actually starts to learn you know, the right actions through that positive feedback. So how does that play into the garden? Well, it has to do with the fact that over time, animals will learn if there is no fight or flight response triggered, they will learn that it's just normal for them and it's essentially just positive feedback for them. And so what you need to do is what's called negative feedback. And negative feedback is basically the, the first part. If you have cans that rattle and it startles them, that is negative feedback. That means don't come into my garden. If you have uh, motion detection sprinklers and it s sprays them with water, that foreign that foreign event that they're not used to scares them. That's negative feedback. And you never want negative feedback to turn into positive feedback by doing it so repetitively that they become used to it because then they associate that with your garden and there's really no negative association anymore. And so now we have to try something new and I'll tell you the secret as to how you can get your pest deterrents to actually stay working. Ah, okay. You were scared. You probably weren't expecting that. Boo, hoogity boogity booty. You probably laughed, but if you were an animal, you wouldn't be expecting it. And so your sense of humor had you laughing, which is great. That's part of the goal of this video, but it's also to show you that by mixing up the scaring tactics, 
you're going to actually have the upper hand because the animal only knows what it's, what it's being repeated. If things are uh, being mixed up and changed up, you actually have the upper hand because you can change the negative feedback. And by, by changing up that negative feedback, it actually always stays foreign. You see, three instances is kind of enough to start that negative uh, or that, that positive feedback loop. But once you change something up, it, it has to adapt. And the animals, they only go by habit. They're creatures of habit. And so the more you change them up, the better. And that is how you can keep them working. So for instance, if you've ever used the, uh, if you've ever used the, the owls that are you know, those fake owls, those are very effective against rabbits. But if you leave the owl in the same location, eventually the rabbits will basically just say, I'm not that dumb. And it'll just continue eating your garden. Whereas if you move the owl around, stay random, stay agile, and basically um, keep, the, keep the rabbit always wondering where that owl is at, then that becomes more effective than just leaving it on its own. If you have things like flashy CDs, use them for a couple days, then switch it up to a motion, de uh, motion detection sprinkler or uh, a radio that plays a loud sound. Farmers have done this in blueberry crops and found that uh, those, those dry shell shotgun shells, um, they're intended to scare the birds away. It's just a, a shotgun that, that shoots off a, a blank round. And that loud sound will scare away the birds. But within 15 seconds, the birds are back. And so it's very ineffective after a while. And that's why many farmers are now turning to uh, noisemakers that alternate their sounds. This is amazing because what you can do is you can simply change the sound up. One second it might be a car horn, next second it might be a, a dog barking, the other second it might be a, you know, a gunshot going off. Uh, and you can alternate those sounds to stay random. And so that is how your pest deterrents stay effective. I hope you guys will have taken something from this video. I know it wasn't a very long video, but we get asked all the time, how are my pest deterrents ineffective? I've spent hundreds of dollars on all these contraptions and they're still not working. And that's because you can spend thousands of dollars on pest deterrents and as long as you, uh, you know, keep them the same, they will begin to be ineffective. And so, um, you know, it's just one of those things that all animals respond this way. It doesn't matter if it's a rabbit, if it's a deer. I can give you example after example after example. Um, but basically, you know, I'd rather you guys just take this information and go into the garden with it than keep going on with examples because I think you get the point. But if you have any other questions, post them in the comments box down below. And the last thing I'll end with that I want to send you guys home with is that uh, the biggest thing as well is know that you're going to lose about 10% of your garden to pests. It's very unrealistic to assume that you're going to get 100% of your garden. And it's known as the 10% rule. It's something that I learned from my grandfather, who learned from probably his grandfather, who basically they, they all in that gardening or that farming community he was a part of learned that 10% of whatever you're growing is going to be basically given to the local wildlife. And that's simply a way of coexisting because you can deter pests for so long, you can spend all the money you want, but you're still gonna lose some, some food. And being realistic with how much you're willing to lose is important because that helps you to kind of realize your, your, your uh, it helps you uh, assess your pros and cons, uh, you know, your cost versus reward, right? Uh, do, do you get, uh, $2,000 worth of vegetables in exchange for $2,000 worth of pest deterrence, it's not really the best cost reward structure, right? So just think about it that way as well, is that you know, you're gonna lose about 10% of your crops, it's just part of coexisting and realizing that we're all kind of sharing this land together. And so I hope you guys enjoyed, I hope you learned something new. As always, this is Luke from the MI Gardener channel reminding you to grow big or go home. I'll catch you all later, see ya, bye.